what does matter is the size of your heart and the strength of your character. Vampires, werewolves, Frankenstein's monster. I mean, this show has it all. And it's kind of ironic that a show all about monsters helped make us happy when we needed it most. Because the monsters aired during a time of civil unrest, confusion, war in Vietnam, conflict at home, I mean just all around hurt. And the last thing we wanted was to think about all that more when we collapsed on the couch and turned on the tube. And then in walked this average American family with average problems. What is it? It's after four o'clock and little Eddie's usually home by- Who just happened to all look like they belonged in a house of horrors. The Munsters rode the wave of new shows depicting fantasy worlds for that good dose of escapism, but it was coupled with calm, relatable stuff. The Munsters considered themselves normal, middle class, and the setup was so perfect Herman, we're trapped, Herman. We're hermetic. for connecting with anyone who felt like an outsider for any reason whatsoever. The Munsters were our family in 1964. And its staying power is so great it only took two seasons for us to love the Munsters even 60 years later. Now if that's not witchcraft, I don't know what is. So welcome to Do You Remember, I am your host Nostalgic Nick, and today we're looking back at the people who brought our favorite monsters to life. What they got into when the makeup came off, and where they ended up after leaving Mockingbird Lane. Fred Gwynn, Herman Munster. The head of the Munster family may look menacing, but he's probably more childlike than the youngster Eddie. Some rotten lesson you're Eddie's teaching my son. <laughs> and instead of a black hole, Herman Munster had a heart of pure gold. Now I can't say too much about the brain, I gotta admit, but that's okay. Grandpa can fix whatever the latest mess is, right? Before he became a giant of Hollywood, Gwyn served as a radio man for the US Navy aboard a submarine chaser. No word yet on whether he fished out the missing link between man and sea monster yet. Now after the war, he attended a little known college called Harvard. Along the way to educational enlightenment, he became a member of the Fly Club, sang with an a cappella group, and was a cartoonist for the Harvard Lampoon, which he later became president of. Geez, is that it? Oh no, no, one more thing. He did all of that while also acting in plays. Where are you going, Eddie? Uh, to the PX, I want to get something to eat. So, a bit of an underachiever, in other words. When he finally popped up on the big screen, it was in the film On the Waterfront. And if you don't know, it's such a stellar film. It's one that made Marlon Brando a household name. But our guy Fred wasn't even in a credited role. It was more of a blink and you'll miss it scene with Marlon. You can see Herman Munster himself as a guy named Slim. Because we love irony here at Do You Remember? But Fred knew deep down that he could have been a contender too. Gosh, I love On the Waterfront. Maybe I'll watch that tonight, and then maybe we can make a video about that one next. Okay, back to the monsters. And a contender he proved to be, as Fred landed his first TV gig on the Philco Television Playhouse. But besides a guest spot on the Phil Silver Show in 1955, it took until 1961's Car 54, Where Are You? Nobody wants to hear me on the guitar. No. Before the industry learned that Fred Gwynn is here to stay, and he's going to do a great job at that. Thank God, too, because the next thing he knew, it was time to climb into the foam padding of Herman Munster. Certainly one of his most known roles, which actually is really saying something. The man's got great presence, but boy, did that come at a cost. The suit and makeup made Fred sweat like crazy. Yeah, understandable. All that gear weighed 50 pounds. Yeah, 50 pounds. And to make up for all the lost perspiration, Fred's drink of choice was lemonade. But he was still losing a ton of weight from just filming. You know, they don't train you for all that at theater camp. And then he had to do it all over again for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Oh, stop exaggerating. Maybe remember that the next time you see the Munster Mobile driving through Herald Square. But like I said, he's got tons of great entries on that resume, like 1989's Pet Cemetery. And of course, in one of my favorites, and I know many of yours, the great My Cousin Vinny, where he terrorized the Utes, who will not tolerate swearing, leather jackets, or delays in the court. Turns out, legal experts agree, My Cousin Vinny is actually one of the most accurate court-themed productions out there. And good job to Fred for helping build the accuracy, while also proving that real can still be highly entertaining to watch without unnecessary and unrealistic thrills. 
Bittersweetly, this was his final hurrah on the big screen, but what a way to cap off an incredible career. Outside of acting, did you know Fred was a professional singer? But wait, there's more. Our regular old renaissance man was also a painter. And his incredible set of skills meant he both wrote and illustrated his children's books. The best part is, their names are as wacky and fun as the stuff we saw on the Munsters, minus the scare factor. Stuff like a little pigeon toad, the king who reigned, and a chocolate mousse for dinner. But sadly, we lost the great Fred Quinn from complications related to pancreatic cancer back in 1993. It was just eight lousy days short of his 67th birthday. So, all rise for the Honorable Fred Gwynn. Ivan DiCarlo, Lily Munster Where there is a bumbling, naive Papa Munster, of course there's his most regal, unshakable wife, Lily, expertly brought to life by the legendary Ivan DiCarlo. This vampire had us all under her spell, with just one look from those piercing baby blues. We actually got Avon after the Munsters pilot was filmed and CBS executives wanted to recast Lily, maybe retool the character too. Turns out Avon has absolutely spot on comedic timing and that made her the easiest casting pick in history. Her exposure is thanks to her legendary, dare I say, biblical history on the big screen. Special shout outs to the Ten Commandments in particular. You couldn't ask for a better powerhouse of skill, but that did kind of come with a unique dilemma. Yvonne was a movie star, and everybody knew that. Yvonne knew it, and so did the cast and crew. There were some early assumptions, especially from Fred Gwynn and Al Lewis, that Yvonne just wouldn't fit in. You know, slumming it with the sitcom TV crowd. Probably the most memorable was when Yvonne first saw herself completely decked out as Lily Munster and in the makeup. It said Avon just burst into tears right there, which probably made the makeup situation a bit harder, huh? Was it the all of seeing this production really come together for the first time? Couldn't move in because there were no kitchen privileges. <laughs> How did I know it was a restricted community? No, it was pure, unfiltered horror. As far as Yvonne was concerned, all that makeup showed how far she'd fallen. That her decorated career, all the hours of work, the difficult decisions, everything. Well, all of it led to her dressing up as a vampire for a silly TV show. The story goes, Fred and Al had a chat with her, and Yvonne straightened out the prima donna attitude pretty quickly then. But in terms of her overall strength of character, Fred and Al would be the first to tell you she really was a standout gal and a standout performer. Rhinestone? Uh, no, no. Tombstone. <laughs> DiCarlo started off in Hollywood all the way back in 1941. It's near impossible to imagine, but even this legend of the big screen started off with uncredited roles. She weathered this storm of anonymity, and her patience paid off in spades with 1945's Salome, where she danced. Yvonne is officially a star at this point, and the bigger jobs flooded in. Next up was Cecil B. DeMille's telling of the Ten Commandments, where she played Sephora, wife of the fabled Moses. Yvonne once again donned the spooky black cloak of Lily Munster in 1966's Munster Go Home and again for the television film Munster's Revenge over a decade later. This brightest star in Hollywood told her thrilling story in her own words through her best-selling autobiography, Yvonne, released in 87. Definitely recommend giving it a read if you're a fan. Her romance life alone could have been a movie. If anyone in Hollywood wants to get started on that, now's the time. Unfortunately, Yvonne was constantly dealing with health problems in the later years of her life, and it all led to a stroke in 1998. Then, in 2007, she passed away from heart failure. But if there's one story that will never be forgotten, it could be hers, and we will treasure Yvonne DiCarlo forever. Al Lewis, Grandpa It's funny to think Al Lewis is one of a few actors who can say they played Count Dracula. Who's your favorite? Gary Oldman's classy seduction, Christopher Lee's menacing power. No, I think I like the Dracula who's a doting grandpa, and a great inventor always cleaning up after his bumbling son-in-law. I mean, come on, Al Lewis was a riot on the Munsters. And on top of the vampire makeup, that laugh alone is the most perfect mad scientist cackle I've ever heard. Two scary things for the price of one. They literally hired the perfect guy. 
and he actually had history with vampires, which is kind of cool. And that's thanks to his very first credit, 1957's Lust of the Vampire. Actually, The Munsters is dripping in horror movie authenticity. The crew used some original genuine props and set pieces from the stuff the show's inspired by, especially Frankenstein, like a dungeon and lab. Uncle Lester got a Wolfman costume, and Uncle Gil got a costume from Creature from the Black Lagoon. Hey, when you're a show that has the rights to the best that Universal Pictures can offer... Rubbish. I don't have any wife in Sioux City. What about Philadelphia? No! Yeah, you take full advantage. And then Al Lewis became a television regular with stuff like Naked City. Not to mention he had history with Fred Gwynn already. Back when Fred played Officer Leo Schnauzer in Car 54, Where Are You? Besides trying his hand at engineering around Mockingbird Lane, Al Lewis was a fantastic judge in used cars, led by Kurt Russell. Lewis worked right up until he was 79 years old. The man could not be stopped. Just when you thought he couldn't get cooler, he does, because it wasn't just acting that Lewis kept busy with, not by a long shot. He was also a restaurant owner, political candidate, and even a radio broadcaster. Just think we almost had the Dracula administration running New York in 1998. Blood banks on every street corner, I can see it now. A total ban on lampposts. No garlic in pizzerias. Okay, maybe I can't back this candidate. Al's health didn't keep up with his spirit, and he even had his leg amputated after complications from an angioplasty. I can't even think about such a beloved childhood icon in that situation. It was really rough for fans to learn that Al Lewis, Grandpa Munster, passed away in February of 2006. He was 82 years old, and it was due to natural causes. He was cremated and apparently had his ashes placed in his favorite cigar box, you know, typical Grandpa Munster, interesting right to the end. Beverly Owen, the original Marilyn Munster. First up to bat was our original Marilyn, Beverly Owen, who stuck around for a total of lucky number 13 episodes. Props for keeping with the theme there. That's almost the family street address. Beverly hopped on board the show pretty convinced it would wind up in an early grave with half of the family. You know, the whole setup just seemed too crazy to picture as a lasting thing, but oh boy was Beverly in for a bit of a surprise. Like I said, the country needed fun escapism like the Munsters, the Adams Family, Bewitched, Genie. I mean, it was the era. Dirty, 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 dirty. Well, here Beverly was on a show that showed no signs of slowing down. At least, not as fast as she imagined. Problem was, she had other commitments, especially of the family kind. This silly little one-off was keeping her away from her fiancé all the way back in New York for an awfully long time. Too long. Well, time to jump ship. Beverly bowed out and tied the knot with a fella named John Stone, who actually went on to produce a little puppet show you might have heard of, Sesame Street. Ah, but sadly for Beverly, it wasn't meant to be between her and Johnny Stone, so ten years later they parted ways. But unfortunately, nothing she did after that would become the cultural phenomenon that the Munsters did. Come on, Uncle Herman, the show goes on in a few minutes. I won't do it, I won't do it, I won't do it, I won't do it. Yeah, kind of rough. Just one more year and a half, and it would have ended on its own. And then Beverly would have been remembered as the Marilyn, and had her schedule all freed up to make things work with John. Well, she still stuck around long enough for Butch Patrick to develop a huge crush on her, one he had no problem opening up about decades later. Good to know Butch was exactly like so many of us in that regard. Probably her biggest non-Munsters thing was Bullet for a Bad Man, led by Audie Murphy in 1964. But as the years since the Munsters grew in numbers, so did the distance between Beverly and the spotlight. All the better to give her some quiet time to study early American history. Solid choice, always love to see someone choose learning. But that radio silence made it really shocking and heartbreaking to learn that she died of ovarian cancer in 2019. The first Marilyn was 81 years old. Pat Priest, Marilyn Munster, number two. And in this corner, weighing in at 57 episodes and a TV movie, we have Marilyn number two, Pat Priest. But Uncle Herman interested in another girl at his age? Well, I mean, he's over 150 years old. 
You want to talk about twinning? Look at Pat Priest and Beverly Owen back to back and you will be basically seeing double. And this was so effective that when the show was airing, a fair amount of people didn't even realize that they changed actors. And I kind of want to know, when did you spot the difference? Did you know when it happened? I mean, I only found out a few minutes ago. Um, anyway. Poor average Marilyn was Herman and Lily's niece, the only one not grazed by some resemblance to a monster movie, whose wretched looks were totally what kept her from finding a boyfriend. Nothing to do with the elephant or vampire or werewolf or other vampire or baby dragon or Frankenstein in the room. Pat's origins were actually in music. She sang and acted on local TV stations for most of her early career. She makes chicken soup with feathers. Doesn't everyone? <laughs> the Munsters were what really gave her career a big boost, with extra help from the reliable Perry Mason. Once she got going, she then popped in on Easy Come Easy Go, alongside the gyrating hips of the king himself, Elvis Presley. With some of the most luscious lovelies who ever filled out a bikini. That's a solid career to look back on, and by 1976, Pat was done. She simply traded Tinseltown for realtor work in Idaho, and she planted roots among those great potatoes for some 20 years. Unfortunately, I've got some more bad news, that in 2001, Pat was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. But wait, this story has a positive twist. Pat got treatment, and it was a total success. She's been in remission ever since. Now she's 88 and taking it easy. She's still enjoying the quiet life, but she's actually all in on nostalgia conventions. Any that have Munster's memorabilia. And in the ultimate bit of Munster's memorabilia, after a long break from that spooky world, Pat appeared in the 2022 Rob Zombie movie. She had a cameo as the Transylvania Airlines announcer. It's not actually credited, it's more of a hidden Easter egg. But I guess that's okay because we found out about that anyway. So what did you think about the Rob Zombie Munsters film? Butch Patrick, Eddie Munster. Nobody even cares enough to be mean to me like other parents. The average nuclear family of typical American vampire, werewolf, and science experiments gone awry, of course has a youngster to get into trouble, learn valuable lessons, and provide the cute factor in a house of horrors. And that solemn duty fell on the canine shoulders of little Eddie. Because we all learned in biology class, on a Punnett square, a vampire and Frankenstein's monster always make a werewolf kid. Hold on, I need to check my old textbook. Well, Butch Patrick actually gave us some great insight into just how he landed his wolfish role. Sure, he had some credits to his name by that point of casting, but it turns out he just really, really kinda looked like Eddie. Butch even said apparently his fangs were his own teeth. They were just so big. They were visible even when he closed his mouth. Gee, Pop, you guys have to pick on me. <laughs> I don't know about that one, but we do know that he was brought into the fold after executives just didn't like the direction that Eddie began as. The first take was way too actually wolfish to the point that he was snarling and acting more like the family dog than a boy. And that felt completely against the spirit of the show, which was trying to prove that hey, these guys may look completely different, but they're as relatable as your own neighbor. Definitely glad they went this direction with Eddie and all the rest. And while they say presence is important to have, sometimes the opposite is true. Butch also got the role because he was just so gosh darn short. And that made the height difference with Papa Fred all the more dramatic. Just tons of perfect features all around. It's like he was born for this role. Butch made his TV debut in 1961 and quickly got a regular gig on The Real McCoys a few years later. Then he moved to 1313 Mockingbird Lane at just 11 years old. That's as solid a start as anyone can hope for, I'd say. Butch had a howling good time in the 70s with an equally trippy show, Sid and Marty Croft's Saturday morning program, Lidsville. You know, the same people who concocted H.R. Puffin stuff. Not sure which one was more bizarre, but it was good times all around. Like his TV papa, Butch was also pretty decent at music and even put out a pop record set to the tune of the Munsters theme. He called it Whatever Happened to Eddie. Of course, this wasn't the last time someone would sample this show's theme. Anybody else want to hop onto the drag Ula and listen to Uma Thurman? 
Speaking of, Butch has pretty much become the keeper of the car. And I always tell him, Hot Rod Herman. And that was when the Dragula first appeared on the scene. Dragging the Dragula to themed conventions and shows to celebrate all things Munster. Dream job. You bet it is. What could be better? Maybe one thing, that one time during filming that Fred drove the fam around the Hollywood Bowl with everyone in full makeup and costume. Oh, to be an everyday pedestrian that day when the Munsters drove by. In 2011, Butch came forward with news that he had prostate cancer. But we're thrilled to say that at 71 years old, he's still doing good. Man, it's great to share good news about our old favorites. There were some hurdles along the way. Butch did deal with drug and alcohol problems, specifically green grass and the white stuff, and dealt with that for 40-some years. In 2010, he checked into rehab, and nowadays he's clean and sober and still acting. I mean, mostly it's just low-budget, lesser-known films, but work is work, right? And hey, he was in the 2022 Munster movie by Rob Zombie. This time, Butch traded the fur for some metal and played the Tin Can Man. Another great cameo for the OG Eddie. You always gotta keep an eye out for cameos. And not to bring the mood down, but I'm pretty thankful we still had these stars around to have cameos. Time really makes the nostalgia grow fonder. But man, it can also be cruel. For a show that lasted little more than two seasons, the Munsters left one heck of a mark. Like that one nightmare that kinda stays with you forever. Except this nightmare is actually a great sitcom bursting with creativity and love. Okay, you know we have to ask, were you more Team Munsters or Team Adams? Did you have a favorite Marilyn, Beverly, or Pat? And who was your all-time favorite Munster who had the best episodes? Well, get down in the comment section and tell us any and every memory of the Munsters, because after all, we're nothing without you. Thanks so much. If you enjoyed the video, hit the thumbs up icon. It really helps our channel grow. And from Nostalgic Nick and my entire team here at Do You Remember, thank you so much for watching and have a spookily wonderful day.